Hey, Humo Soldiers, I'd like to thank everybody who read issue one of Misanthropology e Magazine. As many of you are aware, issue two has been released. For you true crime buffs, there is an article about necrophilia, which includes the story of famous British serial killer and necrophile Dennis Nilsson. Bon appetit! Speaking of the British, the 1980s era children's pop act, the Mini Pops, are featured as an article. The Mini Pops featured little girls wearing mini skirts and putty knife makeup, so it was a little sleazy. Oh, and for those of you who are not aware of my little viral moment, I shot some footage on public transit one day of a woman shaving her pubes. The video has become quite notorious, and I detail the story in this issue, which includes the reaction from actor and comedian Michael Rappaport. Due to his TikTok duet, the video has been seen by over 51,000 people from his account alone. Rappaport was not as amused as I was. Nah, see, people say if you see something, say something. Say something! This is not acceptable! There are other articles about the immoral, the illegal, and the downright weird events and phenomena that only the human race in its dubious glory has to offer. The issue is available for sale at www.misanthropology, that's M-I-S-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-Y dot store. You can download a PDF of the issue there. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. Misty Griffin was born in Phoenix, Arizona in 1982, and there was nothing conventional about the family and life she was born into. Her mother was 17 years old, and her boyfriend was once her stepfather. He was 28 years old at the time. She had a two-year-old brother. Her grandmother witnessed her birth as she stood at the side of Misty's parents. Her grandfather had once been married to Misty's father and accused her daughter of stealing him from her. Misty's grandmother wore the pants in the house. She was remembered by Misty as crafty and vicious. In fact, nobody liked her grandmother. She was dishonest, playing the system like a well-tuned violin so she could receive money without working. Though she was functionally illiterate, she was street smart. She made sure that if a fool had money, it would part ways and take a direct route to her own pockets. She eventually taught Misty's mother the tricks of this trade. Misty's mother was 15 years old when she and Misty's stepfather had their first child, Misty's brother. Her grandmother sought and obtained full custody of her brother on the grounds that Misty's mother was abusive. He was still living with her when Misty was born. Misty's mother was still living with her stepfather slash common-law husband. Misty's grandmother divorced him. The dysfunction was never-ending. Months after Misty was born, her father kidnapped her brother from her grandmother's backyard. There was an outstanding arrest warrant for her parents for the next two years. They moved with Misty and tow from location to location until they settled in Topeka, Kansas. Her younger sister Samantha was born there, and her parents finally got married. Back in Arizona, her grandmother never gave up the search for her brother. At some point between 1984 and 1985, he became one of the first few children to be listed as missing on the backs of milk cartons. When a neighbor of Misty's family recognized him on a milk carton, she reported his whereabouts to the FBI. They raided their apartment and took custody of her brother, who was greatly alarmed and distressed by being removed from his family. 
He was sent back to Arizona to live with Misty's grandmother. She convinced him that she, in fact, was his real mother. Misty's parents got a divorce soon after this incident. Her mother took Misty and her sister back to Arizona to live with her grandmother. This was the only way they could be with Misty's brother. Misty's father spent a few months in prison for kidnapping. When he was released, he moved to Phoenix. He and Misty's mother shared custody of the girls, though they spent most of their time with their father. At first, they enjoyed living with their father, replete with family outings in the Arizona sun. Those salad days would soon come to an end, and when the sun went down on Misty and her sister, they were plunged into depths of despair with which she was unprepared at the age of four. One day, she was sitting on the sidewalk in front of her father's house. Her sister, two years old at the time, was sitting close by. She was tearing grass from the ground by the roots and eating the soil. Misty had a pounding headache, and she nursed her head as she watched her sister. She had recently been attacked by a dog at her aunt's house. It was a great Dane who took her entire head into its mouth and bit down. One tooth slid downward so close to her eye she was nearly blinded. A jeep pulled into her father's driveway. Her mother was the passenger, and the driver was a man with long gray hair. They were blasting rock music, which exacerbated the throbbing pain of Misty's headache. Her father ordered Misty and her sister to go into the house. As Misty grabbed her sister and started toward the house, the man in the jeep unsettled her with his intense, unyielding look. He looked at her in a way that no adult had before, and she was greatly disturbed. Misty was very anxious to escape the crosshairs of that man's glare. So, with her little sister trailing behind her, she made her way toward the house. With only seconds having elapsed, the man got out of the jeep and made a beeline to the girls. He grabbed Misty's arm. The creep factor was off the charts now. He said to Misty, with a grin, Where are you going, gorgeous? She said, My dad is calling me. That's okay, my name is Brian, and you are going to be my daughter now. This made no sense to the four-year-old Misty. She already had a father. How could Brian be her father? Her father was furious. He yelled at her mother as he pushed past her to the girls. Her mother held official-looking documents in her hands, which Misty later surmised were legal and bestowed upon her mother custody of both girls. Brian grabbed Misty and her sister and pulled them over to the jeep, where he pushed them inside forcefully. In a rush, her mother got in the passenger seat and Brian got behind the wheel. Misty's father ran over to the driver's side and shouted at Brian, demanding that he let the girls out of the car. Brian just drove away. The girls waved to their father, and he waved back. That was the last time they saw him. Unbeknownst to Misty at the time, Brian was wanted for child molestation in the 70s a charge that led to him fleeing to Alaska and working as a fisherman. Eventually, he moved to Arizona to work at a gold mine. Brian and Misty's mother drove the girls for three hours to a site among the Bradshaw Mountains situated in northern Arizona. Brian lived in a trailer close to the mine where he worked. Once they were inside... Brian brought the girls to a bedroom furnished with bunk beds and told them to go to sleep. Brian was very strict with the girls. He believed children are to be seen and not heard. He was inconsistent in his relations with the girls. Though he read them bedtime stories, he could also fly into a rage with the slightest of provocations. One of his rules was that not only were they not allowed to talk to strangers in his presence, but they could not talk to each other unless they raised their hands and asked for permission. They were also disallowed from playing with other children. 
the girls became hypervigilant, knowing that anything that would upset Brian would provoke a beating with a switch or a belt. He would strike them 15 times on most occasions. If Misty or Samantha cried, both her mother and Brian would beat them until they stopped. At times, they simply collapsed from the relentless onslaught of torture. Brian would order them to touch their toes as they were tortured. If they lost their balance or slipped from their grip on their toes, he would elongate the beating until they fell in line. The beatings took place about three times a day for both girls. Their mother would always be present. When she wasn't dishing out the beatings herself, she would watch. It was a show for her. Entertainment. Sometimes they would beg her to protect them from Brian, but she would only become enraged and push them back into his clutches. Brian forced the girls to call him Dad, which they resented. Nevertheless, they were forced to comply, lest they receive yet another beating. On Sundays, the family went to church. Brian forbade the girls from talking to people about their home life and to speak only when spoken to. One day in summer, which was a year after her mother and Brian moved the girls to the mountains, her mother told her to remove her clothes and go outside, where she was to stand next to a five-gallon bucket, which was used to bathe her. Her mother gave her baths at that site before taking them into town. Misty hated undressing in Brian's presence because he would always walk over to her and talk to her. He leered at her, stared at her body from head to toe, which made her exceedingly uncomfortable. When she turned away from his gaze, he would become angry and tell her she was ungrateful and selfish. This left her in confusion and contributed to her overall feeling of despondency. On this day, Brian made his way over to the bucket. He was staring, as always, and Misty was uneasy. She couldn't take it anymore. She asked him if she could play in the sawdust pile until her mother was ready to give her a bath. He shrugged, and she ran over to the pile and covered herself with sawdust. When her mother came out of the trailer, she became angry with Misty because of the sawdust. Misty told her that Brian gave her permission to play in the sawdust, but her mother just grabbed her and started shaking her. She told Misty she had the devil in her and that she was going to beat it out of her. Misty started screaming, hoping that strangers within the general vicinity of their home would hear, but it was all in vain. Brian walked up to her and grabbed her. He put her upper torso between his legs. He squeezed with all his strength. She struggled to breathe as his knees compressed her diaphragm. As this went on, her mother lashed her with a large leather belt. It became too painful for Misty to bear, and she tried to wrest herself from Brian's legs. Brian squeezed harder. Her mother said the pain was just a symptom of the devil being released from her soul. Misty screamed from the pain. Her mother laughed at her distress, and Brian encouraged her to keep lashing Misty. When Misty stopped struggling, Brian let go of her. She went limp and fell to the ground. Misty was unable to stand. She had intense pain in her rib cage, and it hurt to breathe. Her ribs had been broken, and they didn't heal properly remaining permanently misshapen. Whenever Brian and her mother took the girls out on shopping trips, Misty would look at girls her age who were accompanied by normal families, and she yearned for a comparable experience. As opportunities to continue to work in the mining industry of Arizona dried up, Brian moved the family to Washington State, where his father lived. The family began their new life in Washington when Misty was six and a half years old and Samantha was five. They met Brian's father, who they liked very much. Unlike Brian, he was a gentle and loving soul. When Misty met Brian's sister, Laura, she was so taken with her that she asked her if she would visit them every day. After Laura left, Brian and Misty's mother backed Misty into a corner 
and both slapped her repeatedly. Brian had a complicated history with his sister. He said to Misty, Don't you ever talk out of turn like that again. In fact, do not talk to her at all. She is only here to see what kind of bad things she could find out about me through you girls. Brian and her mother set the girls on their bed and established the rules. They were not allowed to make any noise while they were beaten. They were not allowed to tell anyone that they were beaten. They must always put on a happy face in the presence of outsiders. If they were ever seen pouting or complaining, they would be beaten. They were not to approach Brian's father for any reason. At night, Brian would search his mind for as long as it took to come up with an excuse to beat the girls, and he would brutalize them with all his strength. When they were not being physically tortured, they would be made to stand in a corner for hours. For the most part, they concealed their pain, but occasionally Grandpa would catch on, and he was disturbed though not disturbed enough to contact the authorities. At the age of seven, Misty had still not been enrolled in school. Her mother's cover story was that she was being homeschooled. There was some home-based instruction, and Misty did learn to read. She read Grandpa's novels. Brian was doing some reading of his own. He read a few books about the Amish, he was evidently inspired by the Amish, for one morning during breakfast, he announced that the family were going to become God-fearing folk and obey the entirety of the Bible, according to a literal translation. He ordered their mother to enroll the girls in a crocheting course, because Amish girls are not allowed to be idle for long. Brian and her mother bought outfits that were typically worn by Amish girls. Brian led the family in Bible study every day. The girls were not to talk to anybody but Brian and their mother, and when they did, they had to raise their hands for permission. In the winter, they would return to Arizona. Because her mother was not legally married to Brian, she was still able to collect government checks. Misty and Samantha were latchkey kids who spent most of their time crocheting and cleaning the trailer they lived in. It was a lonely existence for them both. In autumn, when Misty was seven, her mother realized that her failure to send Misty to school would attract attention from authorities, so she got her enrolled. Though Misty was more advanced in reading than the rest of the class, she was behind them in all other subjects. The teacher was also puzzled that she never went outside for recess and never socialized with her peers. Her mother dressed her normally for school, but aside from her appearance, the teacher knew something wasn't quite right with Misty. Misty seemed to be scared of everyone. Brian and Misty's mother were called in for a conference to discuss the teacher's observations. Her mother kept the homeschooling books, and Misty struggled to educate herself. She dreamed of being a doctor, though with her education it would likely be an uphill climb. To circumvent the no-talking policy, the girls developed a form of sign language to communicate with each other. This was especially useful when Brian would place a tape recorder in their room and threaten to beat them if they made any noise. As if the physical abuse weren't bad enough, Brian forced Misty to put her hands on him. She was forced to shine his shoes, which would be followed by massaging his feet or full-body massages. Her hands would tremble. She hated touching him. He would fondle her, and though she did her utmost to avoid it, she didn't always succeed. She would numb her emotions to get through it. When Misty was nine years old, she and Samantha were made to dress in true Amish garments. Brian had been corresponding with Amish communities about living among them. He was told that because he and her mother were divorced, they would not be permitted to live in any Amish community. They did offer guidance to anybody who wished to live as they did, and he was given the name of an Amish bishop. 
The bishop explained in a letter that he would not mentor him until the entire family abided by the Amish dress code. He gave Brian the address of a company that made clothing for the Amish. Brian ordered dresses, head coverings, aprons, shirts, and broad fall pants. Misty and Samantha found the drab and uncomfortable clothing distasteful, though they eventually adapted to them. Brian believed that print on clothing was evil and prideful. Their mother took sewing lessons, and the girls learned how to make their own clothing. The girls learned to make bread, cook, and clean the kitchen. If they dropped something or made a mistake, they would be beaten with the belt. Their mother would laugh sadistically as she lashed them with the belt, deriving a great deal of satisfaction at their anguish. She was only affectionate toward them when they had company. When Brian was unable to get more work in the mining business, Misty, Samantha, and their mother went to work making dolls with their sewing skills. They would work eight to ten hours a day in their sweatshop home. The girls were not given lunch breaks, and they rarely left the trailer. The homeschooling stopped. Misty was behind in mathematics. Brian and their mother would set time limits on how long the girls had to complete their chores. When Brian beat them, he would pull down their underpants and beat their bare backsides so hard they wound up with large blisters. Clusters of large blisters. During the winter, when Misty was 11, their trailer burned down while they were away. They moved back to Washington, where Brian used an insurance settlement to buy a farm in an isolated spot in the mountains. The real estate agent notified Brian that they would have neighbors, which he was disappointed about. The neighbors were located too far away to be any kind of disruption. Misty and Samantha feared the possibilities of what could be done to them in such an isolated location. They were, however, looking forward to not being cooped up in a trailer all the time. It was true, they would not have to live in a trailer. They pitched tents to live in. Considering that the climate on the mountain was very cold, this promised to test their endurance. The girls were put to work digging with picks and shovels to clear sagebrush so they could begin work on a small shelter. It was very hard work for two girls, one 11 years old and the other 9. They helped to build their shelter aside from cooking, cleaning, and doing most of the other domestic work. Her mother and Brian would fight a lot, and when they did, her mother would drive into town in a huff. When she did, Brian would summon Misty to the loft for a massage. This would be his precursor to him molesting her. When she couldn't take it anymore and pushed him off her, he would become angry and spend the rest of the day looking for reasons to beat her. He would also abuse her emotionally, telling her she was worthless and would never amount to anything. One day when she was 10 years old, he told her mother that she was seducing him and that she should make her stop. Her mother didn't question it and told her it was wrong to seduce men. Misty was dying for her mother to take her side, but she never did. Due to the frigid winters on the mountain, Misty often had frostbite on her toes. On occasion, they would become infected. The sleeping arrangement consisted of two beds in the same room. Misty hated this because Brian would always watch her undress. He would disrobe in the room in front of the girls, which was just as off-putting. The girls were made to rise at 5 a.m. and begin the slave labor for the day, during which they were never to speak. They were frequently beaten for not doing the work fast enough. When Samantha went to town with their mother, Misty was left behind to be sexually abused by Brian. This led to Misty becoming suicidal. Her life was endless toil and abuse. To establish an atmosphere of emotional blackmail in an effort to prevent the girls from reporting the abuse, 
Brian once told the girls that he could chop their heads off, bury them under a tree, and nobody would be the wiser. Given their isolated location, it was easy to believe. They never ran away because it took so long to get to town that they would have been caught by Brian. They were trapped. Also, Brian would on occasion sneak up on the girls when they were unaware to make sure they weren't breaking rules or shirking their duties. Brian's mother went to live with the family because he wanted to be given power of attorney and inherit her money after her death. His mother struggled with health issues like complications of a stroke, Alzheimer's, and a tendency toward urinary tract infections. She required regular bathing to avoid the UTIs. She would cry as she was immersed in the freezing cold water. As she did, Misty's mother would call out from the living room, telling her to shut up and stop being a baby. Brian's mother had glaucoma and required frequent eye drops. She was already partially blind in one eye. Never one to feel empathy for anyone, Misty's mother said, the sooner she goes blind, the better. And the more she sleeps in her room, the happier I will be. I don't want some chatty Kathy sitting around here all day. His mother's door was locked at night, and no one was allowed to enter. Sometimes when the girls finally entered the room in the morning, they would find his mother on the floor, having failed to navigate her way to the pot where she relieved herself. On one occasion, Misty's mother gave Brian's mother a bath in freezing cold water, and as his mother screamed, Misty's mother laughed. Misty's Aunt Fanny went to stay with the family. She was mentally ill and developmentally delayed. She had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had the IQ of a typical three-year-old. She was not taking her medication, though it was required by the state. The only reason she was staying with the family was the stipend Brian and Misty's mother received for taking care of her. They forced her to dress in Amish garb. Keeping Fanny off her medication made her easier to control since she did not understand the situation in which she was living. Misty's mother was required to see a psychiatrist about Fanny's situation. She managed to convince the doctor that the farm, with all its fresh air and sunshine, was a better option than being cooped up in an institution. She agreed to ensure that Fanny receive her meds, and with that, the doctor dismissed them. Misty remembers this as an occasion when freedom was in her grasp. She was tempted to tell the doctor about the abuse she endured. But Brian had filled her head with a bunch of bullshit about how the doctor was a so-called worldly outsider and, as such, was going to hell. Brian's group of control scared her off the idea of seeking assistance from a mandated reporter. On the way home, Misty's mother stopped at Burger King as she was in a celebratory mood. She had managed to fool the government once again. Both she and Brian hated the government and always sought to defraud it of what they could. She bought everybody hamburgers. She was so ebullient, she even put a hand on Misty's shoulder. She was usually so uniformly cruel that Misty felt uncomfortable with her touch. Being loved by her mother was such a rare occurrence, it was downright exotic. Fanny's psychologist recommended a visit from a social worker to ensure that Brian's compound was a suitable environment for someone with special needs. Misty's mother had already completed the paperwork to gain full custody of Fanny, which complicated the efforts of social services to get access to the family's home. Misty's mother dealt with the situation by visiting the social worker at her office and telling her that their church did not approve of having government workers in their homes and that they would be punished for allowing their presence to infiltrate their lives. The social worker believed her, though she requested some family photos. To accommodate this requirement, Misty's mother bought a cheap disposable camera and lined everybody up. Everybody had to put on fake smiles. 
Her mother arranged for contrived scenes, like Fanny sitting on a bale of hay while the girls worked. At the age of 17, Misty was more depressed than ever. She was a slave with no escape from her situation. The only relief came from appearances by her Aunt Laura and her husband Bill, but they stopped visiting due to friction with Brian. Misty had nothing to look forward to and could see nothing about her life that made her want to continue living. One day, while Fanny was mopping the front porch, she accidentally broke the mop's handle. Misty dreaded the reaction this would provoke from her mother or Brian. Sure enough, her mother emerged from the front door in a rage. She shouted at Fanny, What the hell did you do? She grabbed the pole and started beating Fanny with it. Fanny screamed from the pain. Misty was so disturbed from the sound of Fanny's cries that it gave her flashbacks. Misty's mother left bruises all over Fanny's body. It made Misty so angry she began to fantasize about hitting her mother in the head with a shovel. She could not understand how her mother could derive amusement from inflicting pain on others. Misty and Samantha alternated between working in the house and outside, taking turns on a weekly basis. During Misty's next week spent indoors, she was still haunted by Fanny's beating and Fanny's reactive hysteria throughout. Unable to cope with the situation anymore, Misty took a butcher knife and took it to her wrist. She took a deep breath and closed her eyes. She said to herself, Just do it. She tried to cut a deep wound, but pulled back at the last minute, only scratching herself enough to draw a light trickle of blood. She tried again, but she realized she wanted to live after all. She just didn't want to live there. The problem was, she could not bring herself to abandon Samantha, Fanny, and Grandma. They needed her for their survival since Brian and her mother were content to abuse them and neglect them of their medical care. Misty wrapped a towel around the wound on her wrist to stanch the bleeding and finished her chores. She developed a prayer that became a mantra she repeated to herself over and over. I've got to get the hell out of here somehow. Oh God, please get me out of here. I don't belong here. Please God. Please God. As Misty's 18th birthday was drawing near, she and Samantha began to discuss how they would change their lives once they became adults. Misty said, I know when I turn 18, they cannot beat me anymore. I will be an adult and able to make my own choices. Brian sure didn't give her any motivation to stay as he began beating her more frequently for not finishing her chores within the required time limit. He said to her one day, so you think because you were almost 18, you can start slacking off? You better pick up the slack. I swear to God, I will be beating you when you are 50. You are never going to get away from me, never. She yelled at him, you can't do that. He put his face up against hers. Oh yeah, and who is going to stop me? What are you going to do, run away and prostitute yourself? Oh yeah, maybe you should. He threw her to the ground. You would make a good little whore. She knew he was right about her being unable to stop them. She became determined to run away while they were unaware. On Misty's 18th birthday, she intended to tell Brian and her mother that as an adult, she wanted to make her own decisions. She could never summon the courage, fearing the retribution that would come her way in the form of emotional and physical violence. All she could do was clear her throat. Samantha whispered to her, What is wrong with you? What do you want me to do, Samantha? You know they are never going to agree to anything I ask. And they could very well really hurt me. I don't know what to do. I really don't. They will never let any of us leave here. You know that. Misty struggled to figure out the best time to tell Brian and her mother that she wanted to leave, but after several months, she was still unable to do it. 
Meanwhile, her resentment at being nearly 19 years old, beaten frequently and forced into slave labor, only continued to increase. She feared that if she didn't take action against it soon, she would still be in that position at the age of 30. One day in April, Misty was outdoors with Fanny. They were thawing out a water faucet that had become frozen throughout the night. Once they finished, Misty went into the house to get a hammer so she could nail the wood and insulation back onto the faucet. When she went inside, she saw that Samantha was mopping the floor. Not wanting to spoil her cleaning by tracking mud all over the floor, Misty placed the hammer down inside the door jamb, whereupon she took Fanny outside so they could finish their morning chores. At one point, Samantha summoned Misty into the house, explaining that Brian wanted to see her. When all three girls stood in the living room, Misty was tired and irritable. Her patience with Brian was in short supply. She said to him, What do you want? He pointed at the door. Did you put that hammer there? Uh, yeah. I was going to put it away at dinner time. Why did you not put it away when you were done, like you were supposed to? Well, I didn't want to track up Samantha's floor while she was mopping, and I did not think it would hurt anything. Her mother said, Why did you not come and ask our permission? Misty was astonished. What? It seemed kind of unimportant, I guess. Her mother said, Oh, asking our permission is unimportant to you? This was about as much of this discussion that Misty could take. It's just a hammer. I don't understand what the big deal is. Her mother said, The big deal is that you think just because you are 18, you can do whatever you want without running it past us first. And at the same time, you assume we should feed you and clothe you with your arrogant and evil attitude? Brian walked toward her and said, Now, to teach you a lesson, you will bend over and touch your toes like a good little girl, while I beat the hell out of your butt. Samantha was shaking her head vigorously and mouthing the words, Don't do it. Don't do it. Brian pointed at the floor and said, I told you to bend over. Misty straightened her posture and clenched her fists. She whispered, Please, Lord, help me. Please, Lord. Her mother said, Excuse me? Misty was firm. No, I will not do it. I am a grown woman, and you have no right to tell me what to do or to beat me. She took a deep breath to regain her composure so that her voice wouldn't sound uncertain. She continued, That much I know about the law. And if I go to the police station right now, they're going to haul you both off to jail, where you belong. Misty punctuated this last remark by stomping her foot. She savored the look of shock on their faces. Brian said, You were going to do none of those things, and you know why? Because we did not give you permission, that's why. No, I don't need your permission. I am an adult now, and I will do what I think is right. Bend over and touch your toes, now. Brian pushed her. Misty wouldn't budge. No. Now. No. I said touch your toes, damn it. He grabbed her and tried to force her into a bent position. She pushed him back, yelling, no, and you can't make me. Brian grabbed her head and began twisting it. It seemed to her like he was trying to snap her neck. She felt increasing pressure in her head. It began to seem like he was going to kill her. She felt herself on the verge of blacking out. She thought to herself, no, this is not how it was supposed to end. Misty tried to resist as he continued to twist her head. Suddenly, Samantha screamed, you're killing her. No, no. Misty's mother interjected, Samantha, don't. Leave him alone. She deserves it. Samantha ran up to Brian and jumped on his back. She wrapped her arms around his throat in an attempt to choke him. He lost most of his grip on Misty, enough that her senses were restored as she was on the precipice of blacking out. As Misty fell to the floor, Brian threw Samantha across the room and over a table. She hit the floor as some canning jars fell off the table. Brian ran over to her, calling her a 
meddling little bitch. Misty's mother watched all this calmly, taking it all in as if it were just a television show. Misty struggled to her feet. She was dizzy and surprised to find that she was still alive. She was terrified of what he might do to her next. So Misty distracted him by running upstairs and shouting, I am leaving now. I am going to the police, and they are going to enjoy all the evidence you guys are leaving for them. Misty had no way to escape, so she retreated into a corner. Brian and her mother ran up the stairs and into her room. Brian grabbed her feet and pulled her toward the edge of the bed. Misty kicked at him, landing one on his forehead. It stunned him for a moment, and she took advantage of the distraction by retreating back to the corner. He grabbed her and shoved her into the wall. Her mother stood there with her arms folded. Misty screamed at her, Mama, help me get this jerk off of me. Her mother said, Why should I protect you when you want to betray us? As Misty slid to the floor, dodging Brian's slaps, she said, I am your daughter. Misty suddenly spotted an opportunity to escape. She rolled onto her stomach and slipped through Brian and her mother's legs. She ran to the staircase and down the stairs. When she reached the front door, she heard Samantha shouting at her to keep running, and she did. Misty heard her mother shout at Brian to get the truck. Minutes later, Brian caught up with Misty in the truck. He said, get in the truck right now. She said nothing and kept walking. Misty, get your ass up here and get in the truck before I come down there and make you. She still had the headache from when he tried to snap her neck, and she was unable to proceed through the brush any longer. She lost her nerve and got into the truck. When Misty returned, Samantha said to her, you know he was for real trying to kill you, right? He was just about ready to snap your neck when I jumped him. Misty said, yeah, thanks for that, Sam. As they made their way through the door, Brian said, All right, sit down. Misty's mother had her arms crossed and was glaring at the girls. Misty glared back at her until her mother looked away. Brian had an announcement. All right, I knew this day was coming so I have been writing to the bishop. A few weeks ago, he sent me the address of one of their Amish communities in Minnesota, which is closer to us than Pennsylvania would be. He knows the bishop there, and the community would be willing to take you girls in so you can join the church. They are in desperate need of new bloodlines, so you would be an asset to them. Misty assumed at the time that their decision to ship her and Samantha off to the Amish was done to negate their likelihood of notifying the police of the abuse, since the Amish resisted the presence of police in their community. Misty later discovered that the real reason they were sent to the Amish community was so that the girls would find out they couldn't survive without Brian and their mother. Misty was uneasy about the fact that she and Samantha would be separated. Samantha said, If we don't go along with the plan, we are not going to get out of here alive. Ever. Misty said, All right, but if you don't show up when you are supposed to, rest assured, this time I will go to the police and report them. Samantha agreed to these conditions. Ultimately, both girls were taken to the community at the same time. Though it wasn't exactly the life they wanted, it was better than what they encountered on a daily basis on the mountain. Their introduction to life with the Amish involved an extensive briefing. Because they were not fluent in German, they would not understand many of the religious texts and the invocations of their religious ceremonies. In keeping with the uniformity of their culture, they were told that their names would have to be changed to Amish names. Misty and Samantha were considered to be prideful. Generally, the names they were offered were derived from the Bible. Samantha chose Beth. Misty chose Emma. The girls were relieved to see that the children were not being beaten all the time. In fact, their mothers even had to repeat their calls to dinner on occasion. This was just an introduction to life in this community. 
The next day, Brian showed up with Fanny, and they all drove home. When they pulled up at the house, Misty's mother didn't even say hello. She ignored them, reading a romance novel. Misty discovered that Grandma's care had been neglected, and a stench of urine surrounded her. Misty felt guilty about the conditions she was leaving behind for Grandma and Fanny as she was dispatched to her new life as Emma Schrock. Ultimately, she could only focus on her sister's liberation. As Misty and Samantha were preparing to depart for the Amish community in the fall, Brian and her mother were applying to be foster parents. Misty felt great pity for the children who were about to be beaten and enslaved as she was. Samantha arrived at another house amid the Amish compound. At first, Samantha was nearly catatonic, mostly in the company of the Amish women. She was clearly disturbed. Misty said, Okay, what happened? Did Mama and Brian hurt you? Samantha passed her a letter. She said, This is for you. Did you know that Brian and Mama did not expect you to make it here? They thought you would get in a bunch of trouble with the church, and they would send you back and we would both be stuck there forever. Misty wasn't surprised to hear it. Samantha said, No, really. When we went home after we left you here, Brian said the bishop would probably send you back within the month. They never intended to let us go, ever. Never. They were never going to let us go. Up until last week, Brian was still waiting to hear from the bishop to say you were not fitting in. So what made them bring you here? I told them you were going to the police if you did not see me within one week of the set day. And I would have. Well, they dropped you off, though. I am only 17. What if they come back for me? Oh, don't be silly. Why would they do that? It's only a few months till you are 18. And if they come for you, you just won't get in the car with them. Mama was mad at me. She called us ungrateful bitches who deserve to be stoned to death for our disloyalty. Misty said, Mama is nothing but a crazy psycho who deserves to be locked away from society for the rest of her natural life. Samantha was concerned that she wasn't going to fit in with the Amish with as much skill and confidence as Misty. Misty struggled a little at first, but she eventually dressed according to the strict code expected of women. She accepted her position within the male-dominated hierarchy that was formulated according to the Bible's views on the rightful positions of men and women in society and family. She even learned some German so that she could communicate in keeping with the linguistic tradition. The Amish not only refuse to call the police when one of their own commits a serious offense against another, but after a period of banishment, they forgive them and accept them back into their society. They had even done this with child molesters. Misty was overwhelmed by her concern regarding Fanny and Grandma. They were vulnerable to Brian and her mother's tortures and she couldn't bring herself to tolerate it one more day. One night when Misty sat down with a man named Jacob, to whom she had become closely bonded, along with his wife Lillian, Jacob said, Emma has something else she wants to tell us. Lillian said, How do you know? She was jealous of Misty because of all the private time she had alone with Jacob, even though the two of them were not having an affair. Misty said, Look, I just went with him so I could talk to my sister. And what was so important that you could not wait till Friday when we go to help clean for church? Misty buried her face in her hands and began to cry uncontrollably. Lillian was growing impatient with Misty. So, what did you do that you need to confess? Misty had had an ass full of this treatment from Lillian and she was sick of it. She stood from the table, sending her chair flying back. You know what, Lillian? I am tired of having you accuse me of trying to get attention all the time. Do you know the very real problems I have? No, you don't. I have an aunt who is literally being tortured every day by my evil mother and stepfather. 
My grandmother was once made to wash her own sheets in the freezing cold when she wet the bed. They are both starved and given ice-cold baths. And my wonderful parents are soon going to be foster parents. That is why I've lost weight and can't sleep at night. Lillian said, What are you planning to do? I am sorry, Lillian. I shouldn't have yelled. Lillian was hardly sympathetic. No, you shouldn't have. You need to work on your sense of entitlement. Do you think you are the only one with problems? No, that is not what I think. But I do think that I am the only one who is willing to do anything about them. I can't let them stay up there to suffer. I cannot live with myself anymore. Well, we don't go to the police, so I don't know what you plan to do. What? That is your response when I tell you someone is being tortured. It's not the first case like this I have heard of. I know many families where the fathers and mothers beat their children. It's just how it is. You can't think like that. It's wrong, and people like this have to be stopped. We are Christians, and we are supposed to follow Christ. He would never have condoned such behavior. Your job is to do what you are told and make sure you are following the rules. My job as a fellow human being is to care for the helpless whenever I can. It is inhumane to allow this to continue. It goes against nature itself. That is not your concern. You are far too proud if you feel you could ever change anything. Who do you think you are? Lillian was livid. She turned to Jacob. It is not our way for our people to interfere like this. Tell her, Jacob. Misty said to Lillian, It's your way to let people suffer, as long as you don't look proud doing it. Jacob held up his hand to silence the women. He said, Hold on. I will talk to the bishop and elders about this matter. We normally would not do this, but the fact that Brian is beating his own mother and Sue is beating her older sister is a grave matter. This shows disrespect for their elders, and since they are not Amish, it may be acceptable to alert the authorities about this matter. Lillian got up from the table in a huff, she said to Jacob, you're good about making up rules when they are in your favor, Jacob. You just asked me here tonight, so I would not think something was happening between you two. She turned to Misty. I know you would be happy if I killed myself. You could have my family then. Misty was astonished. What? I don't want your family. Why would you say such a thing? Jacob stood. He said to Lillian, Lillian, you will be silent. He yanked her by her arm back toward him. Are you trying to ruin us? After the local Amish council held a meeting and debated the matter of whether Misty should be permitted to notify the police about what Brian and her mother were doing to Fanny and Grandma, they decided it would be an acceptable course of action since Brian was dishonoring his mother, which was a serious transgression in their eyes. They also saw her mother as dishonoring her sister. Though Misty was grateful for their consent, she was put off by the fact that it had less to do with compassion for people who were suffering than an observance of tradition and protocol. Misty did contact the police, but they told her there was no evidence to convict. Two officers did visit the compound, but noted that everything looked fine with Fanny and Grandma. Brian and Misty's mother acted like they were sad about the accusations. They claimed that Misty was just a rebellious teenager who was vindictive because of the conservative lifestyle with which they raised her. Misty, Samantha, and a few family members from the Amish community went to Brian and Misty's mother's farm in the mountain. Misty asked her mother if she could take Fanny to live with her among the Amish, but she refused. They ended up with a literal tug of war, with her mother winning. Her mother shoved Fanny in the house. Her mother unleashed a flurry of punches on Misty until Brian separated them. When Misty and Samantha returned to the buggy and it headed down the mountain, a senior relation, Mr. Fletcher, said, We are going to the police station. Nobody objected. 
except for Misty and Samantha, who had been used to the violence that existed in Brian and her mother's house. Everyone else was in shock. They were ashen. After the police visited the farm, they returned to the station and told everybody there was no evidence of the crimes for which Brian and Misty's mother were accused. Brian and Misty's mother had swindled again. While most Amish are morally upstanding people, sexual abuse has been known to happen in these isolated communities. As Misty was about to be baptized, she expressed her feeling of disappointment to her friend Phyllis that she didn't have normal parents to attend the baptism. She said, I wish I had a real mom and dad to be here when I am baptized. I would like someone to be really happy for me, you know. All the other youth have real family around them, and I don't really have anyone. Phyllis touched her arm and said, Well, we are all happy for you. Misty said, Your mom and dad are coming. I wish my parents were nice and would visit. It would be nice to feel a real family connection like that. Phyllis reacted by looking downward, whereupon she burst into tears. Misty had stumbled upon a dark secret. Phyllis was about to shatter Misty's illusions, which were based on mainstream Amish propaganda. You know... I am terrified that my parents are coming here. I was very happy when I married Peter and moved out here to be near his family. Misty said, why? Phyllis said, my father is an evil man. He molested all of us girls. He went after every last one of us when we were between the ages of 12 and 15. Those were the ages he liked, and it meant three years of hell for each one of us. I can't help but think that my Katie will be 12 in a little over a year. Misty was outraged. Why didn't anyone do something? How could he just get away with it? Oh, Mom would report him to the church every couple of years, and he would confess to his so-called weakness. When I became a church member, I had to sit there and hear his confessions in church. It was such a joke, and it made me sick. All he confessed to was having a weakness of the flesh. While he cried and begged for forgiveness from the church members, no one was even remotely concerned about the well-being of his children. No one asked if we were okay. Once, I found my sister, who was about to be married, with my father. They were both moaning. I don't think they saw me, but there has been gossip that her firstborn child is my father's. Those two still have a strange relationship to this day. I think at first my sister was a victim, and then something happened to her. We were never close, and most people think she is really odd, but it is not her fault. I think something snapped inside her, and she is not really quite all there. Even though she was beyond my father's preferred age, she became easy prey. There was no one who would stop him. Even if a man is put in the ban, he still has full access to his victims. Our dad continued to molest us even while he was in the ban. It did nothing, and to think our entire church knew about it. How could they just leave us there in that house? But they did, and we were not the only family that was like that. I was so glad to marry Peter and get out of that house. Phyllis looked out the window. It is good to know that he no longer has any children at home. But the grandchildren. Misty said, I don't understand how our church can put up with this evil. It is an outrage and a crime against humanity. Though Phyllis was in agreement, she was also helpless against the circumstances. As she said to Misty, There is nothing we can do, though. If anyone knows I have told you this, I will be placed in the ban for bringing up church matters that have been resolved and for not forgiving my father. I am supposed to forgive and forget, but I can't. I just can't. He hurt me and my sister so badly, so very badly. And then a few years ago, he was elected deacon. 
Why would God let that happen? Good question. The church found a way to forgive people who sexually abused children, yet it was inflexible and unforgiving when it came to rules regarding superficial considerations. One quote, The women's dress hem shall be four inches wide, and the dress shall be no shorter than six inches from the floor. No sleeves rolled up on Sunday. Men's shirt cuffs shall be two and a half inches wide. The horses' harnesses shall be black. The buggies shall be black with no trim or carpeting allowed. All house curtains shall be dark blue. No shingles allowed for roofing. No flowers allowed in the front of the house. Only in the garden. That did not represent the be-all and end-all of Amish rules. And if any of them were broken, it was tragic within the rubric of their belief system. The way they saw it, it would have been like shoving one of Satan's horns straight up Jesus' ass. These people are uptight, to say the least. One day, one of the community's bishops made an announcement. A couple of weeks ago, we got a letter from Larry, who has been living in Russia for the past year. He says he recently married a young woman from there and now requests permission to come back here to live among us, as he did a few years ago. After much prayer and after we talked with the rest of the men, we believe his past transgression should not be held against him. Therefore, the ministers and I have written him to say it would be all right for him to live nearby if he wishes. He still dresses like us, and his wife will do the same. It is our duty to forgive him. Though accepting Larry back into the community was not optional for most, given that the leadership had issued its edict, not everybody was thrilled to find out Larry would walk among them. Misty eavesdropped on a conversation that went like this. Remember what he did to Laura? Yeah, but how is that different from one of our men with the same shortcomings? Well, he went to prison in the 80s for holding those people from Asia on his farm and making them work while he molested their children. That is really weird, and we have to remember, he is a worldly outsider. So are Emma and Beth. Yeah, but they were young girls who had been raised on a mountain somewhere. They are less worldly than our own children. Larry showed an interest in Misty. He told her that his 24-year-old wife, Zoya, could learn English and other things from her. He was 65. It was a struggle for Misty to hide her contempt for the man. He reminded her of Brian. The FBI later showed up and arrested Larry for failing to register as a sex offender. He was imprisoned for a month. One day a man who lived in the non-Amish world was stapling posters of Larry around the neighborhood when he spotted Misty walking by herself. He offered to give her a ride home. She could later hear him confronting Jacob. You knew this guy was a sex offender, and you let him just waltz in here and be part of your group? Well, we do not believe in labeling people as you English do. We believe in forgiving and forgetting. It is our way. Well, that might be your way, but it sure as hell is not mine. My wife and I have three pretty little girls, and if this creep so much as looks at one of them, I'm going to put a bullet straight between his eyes. Jacob said, We would never seek revenge like that. Revenge is the Lord's, not ours. Oh, is that so? And if that guy came in here tonight and raped that sweet girl I just gave a ride to, you would be just fine and dandy with that? Well, we would not be happy, of course, but we would not seek revenge. Revenge? You have got to be kidding me, man. What about honor? What about justice? That is not our way. Well, you know what? Screw you and screw your ways. 
I have never understood you people, you know that? I have an older brother who died defending this country, so you people could look down on him and on us while you farm here, enjoying the very things my brother died for. Jacob laughed. We did not kill your brother. Oh, you think that's funny, do you? Well, if people like my brother didn't die for you, you would not be enjoying the freedoms that you have here. That's your opinion. No, that's a fact. I don't understand why you people look down on us. Call us the English and keep to yourself. When you need a ride or a telephone or something, you have no problem running to us. But it is a sin to have these things yourselves. That's just weird. That is our way. Yeah, exactly. Maybe someone needs to let you guys see the real world of taxes and government and how things really work for a while. Maybe then you would appreciate your country a little more. We are not citizens of this country. Well, just tell this sex offender friend of yours, if he comes near my property, I cannot vouch for his safety. My daughters mean too much to me to care about whether I heard him or not. The man drove off. Misty went to work for Phyllis and her husband Peter as a maid. Peter would occasionally make sexual overtures to Misty. He would brush against her chest and play it off like it was an accident. But it happened more than once. One day when he was in a darkened basement, he asked her for matches to light a lamp. The Amish women were in the common practice of carrying matches in their pockets to light fires for cooking and heating. When he lit his lamp, he revealed that his pants were open and he was wearing no underwear. He was erect. This frightened Misty, and she ran upstairs. It's hardly surprising. He would hint when his wife was recovering from a seizure that Misty would make a good replacement. She found him creepy and wouldn't have even considered marrying him. The sexual harassment continued. He would expose himself to her whenever the opportunity presented itself. If she was taking a bath, he would stand there by the door and stare at her, which would make her skin crawl. He would go as far as to stare at her breasts or even poke his erection into her back. He would hug her when nobody else was around and pass his hands up and down her body. She wanted to report his doings, but she knew that if she did, she would be accused of having provoked him. He came into her bedroom at night to stare at her. The Amish are against the practice of locking bedrooms, so even that form of protection was not availed to her. Peter continued to make unwanted advances toward Misty, often while she was in bed. He would reach under the covers and molest her. It culminated in an incident when he cornered her outside their house. He put his hand over her mouth and another on the back of her coat. It was an ambush. He pulled her around to the side of the house and pushed her into a corner. He said, Where do you think you are going? Misty said, It's none of your business. She went from fearing him to becoming enraged. She lunged away from him. He grabbed her and attempted to throw her back in the corner. She put up a fight. His hands opened up like beasts starving for female flesh and pinched her breasts with so much strength it was as if he were trying to reshape them. He put his hands under her dress and they wandered in search of other boundaries to breach. They reverted back to her breasts. He pinched and twisted them with so much force she gasped as the pain shuddered through her. This was such a violent assault, it set her off balance. Peter grabbed her and yanked her back toward her bedroom. Misty finally managed to break from his grasp and ran toward the quarters of her friend Karen, who was an outsider renting a building for residential and professional purposes on Phyllis and Peter's property. Peter did not continue his pursuit. Misty arrived at Karen's place, the only sanctuary available to a young Amish girl. Karen could tell instantly that something was out of place. She said, Emma, what is wrong? Misty was rattled by her encounter with Peter. 
She was trembling. She said, I am so scared of Peter. Karen's husband, Carl, got up from their table where he was eating breakfast. He said, what happened? Unlike the Amish, who were reluctant to listen to such a story and would have passed on a lenient sentence to the offender, Karen grabbed her by the shoulders and said, What has happened, Emma? Misty was reluctant to tell her. She was so used to living in an atmosphere where the victims didn't matter and were forced to interact with the perpetrators during and after their period of banishment. Karen coaxed her. Emma, Emma, tell me what happened. Why is your dress ripped? What is wrong with you? Misty was so overwhelmed by the trauma, she passed out. Karen caught her before she hit the floor. When she came to, Karen was passing a cool face cloth about her face. Misty was finally able to disclose what Peter did to her. Peter came in my room this morning and was feeling me up under my dress. He was going to undress me, but the children began calling for him. And then when I was leaving my room, he attacked me. He told me he will be back tonight. I think he is going to rape me. I can't go back there, and I can't go back to Jacob's. Even if they believe me, he will only be shunned for a few weeks, and then I will have to forgive him. What if he tries it again? I should have screamed when he was in my room. Misty was crying at this point. Karen and her husband Carl had been kneeling. They stood and put their coats on. Karen said, It is common for sexual assault victims to not scream when they are being assaulted. Stay here. We are going to confront this piece of shit. The Amish sure had a hold on Misty's mind, she said. No, Karen, he is a dangerous man. You shouldn't get mixed up in this. I don't know what would happen to you if you crossed him. Carl said, We can take care of ourselves, Emma. Don't worry. Karen had been involved in some white-collar crime, which included some jail time and probation. She had never been exposed to something like sexual abuse. When Karen and Carl returned, Karen said, I never thought I would get mixed up in something like this out here in Amish country. That is why we asked to live out here while I finish my probation. I can't get mixed up in any sort of violence or these kinds of situations. It would jeopardize my probation. Misty said, I know. I shouldn't have gotten you mixed up in this. I have to go tell Jacob and hope that I can move back in with them. I have nowhere else to go. But what if Jacob says he is sorry and I am forced to stay there? Emma, you can't do that. You have to go to the police. He readily confessed to us that he attacked you. He told us that he has sex with the animals, too. He has done it his whole life, and he said he confessed many times to the church and was forgiven. I think he is immune to church discipline now. And... He told us that it would be so easy to smother you in your sleep at night. No one would ever know. None of this came as a surprise to Misty. She knew that sometimes Peter fornicated with the calves. On one occasion, he alluded to it by sucking on his finger. Carl said, He knows we can't do anything, Emma. He knows that we can't get mixed up in any crime because of Karen's parole. We told him as much when we moved here. But he is a bad man. He needs to be stopped. You have to go to the police, Emma. I can't, Carl. It's against the church rules. I will be shunned. Well, do you want to end up dead? Misty took this seriously and began to envision the scenario of reporting Peter to the police. She was so indignant and outraged by what he had done that she became driven. She wasn't the only one who had suffered. The abuse and the laissez-faire approach to punishing the guilty parties had gone on long enough. She decided she had to do something. She said, I will go to the police. I will tell them about Peter. Karen, can you drive me? Karen grabbed her arm. Hold on. I want to make sure you have thought this through and that this is your decision. 
You know you could be put in the ban if you go to the police. Misty yanked her arm away. She screamed, Don't touch me! Misty didn't mean anything by it. Her recent experiences with being touched only involved abuse and sexual impropriety. She said, I'm sorry. I just don't want anyone touching me, okay? You are not even Amish. Why should you care if I'm put in the ban? I just know you have to live here in this community. And I know it is not easy for a girl to be put in the ban. Misty still wasn't sure if she was doing the right thing. Like a cult, the Amish rejected critical thinking when it came to their belief system and engaged in a great deal of brainwashing, especially with converts. But you think I should go to the police, right? Karen put her coat on. She said, I just want to make sure you aren't going to clam up when they start questioning you. That's all. If I weren't on probation and I had a gun, I would go up there and put some buckshot in his ass. That's the best solution to this problem. Karen put a baseball cap on. Misty asked her why she was wearing it. Karen said, I am taking you to the police, but I am not going in with you. I can't be associated with any violence. I can't have anything mess up my parole. When they arrived at the police station, Karen reminded Misty that just because Peter would be reported would not guarantee he would be arrested. Misty accepted this because she knew it was time for real justice to be served. Misty met with an officer who was to take her report. She had divulged some information to the officer at reception. He said, So you were saying that the bishop of your church assaulted you and he is threatening to kill you? Yes, that is what happened. Do you have any evidence to support any of these allegations? This was hard for her to do. She was reluctant to show scars and other marks indicative of abuse because it was so antithetical to the Amish policy of modesty as it pertained to women. The officer said, Well, we can't just go out and arrest someone for unsupported claims made about them. She said, What do you mean? This man is going to hurt me, and I am absolutely positive he has been poisoning his wife. And you are saying there is nothing you can do? Hold on, Emma. Just sit back down. I didn't say there is nothing we can do. I just said we cannot arrest someone without evidence to support the accusations. Well, what kind of evidence do you need? For instance, if you had been raped, we could do a rape kit, and that would give us physical evidence. So you were saying I should have let myself get raped? No, no, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying that right now, it is just your word against his. I am not going to go haul the bishop of the Amish church in without any evidence to prove he has committed a crime. Misty was getting angry about the fact that the officer reacted with skepticism and inertia to her report. Can I just tell you briefly what is really going on? His next statement did nothing to alleviate those feelings. I don't know. I find all of it hard to believe. We have a good relationship with our Amish neighbors and have never had any trouble with them. Of course, you haven't had any trouble with them. Do you think they are going to tell you if someone is raped, murdered, or poisoned? You know that we are a society set apart from the rest of the world. What would make you think they would ever let you know what is really going on out there? Do you think anyone else from your community would come forward and support these claims you were making? Misty soon realized this was unlikely, especially when it came to the victims who were born into the Amish life. She shook her head. The officer said, Well, I really don't know what we can do except go out and question his family to see if everything is okay, but I even hate to do that to an Amish bishop. Why? If he were not Amish, you would not hesitate to bring him in, right? Well, it's just that anyone could make the case that you are an Amish girl that is angry about something and has decided to falsely accuse the bishop of her church of a crime for revenge. Standing now, Misty slammed her hands on the table and leaned into his personal space. 
Why is it so hard for you people to believe the Amish are just as capable of a crime as any other human being? The only difference is that they don't have to pay for their crimes. And ironically, these very people you hold in such high regard think you are all going to hell because you are of this world. Well, I am sure that is probably true. They are regular people, but they are raised with a strict doctrine they have to follow. Or what? Can you tell me the Amish policy on rape and murder? Well, I never thought of them like that. Exactly. I am so tired of you English putting cameras in our faces and taking our picture like we are cute little puppies or something. We are people with all the same faults the rest of the human race has to offer. Do you really think they would even bother to tell you if I died tonight? No, you would never know. I would simply be buried in a Amish cemetery, and no one would think I had died from some unknown cause. I find that a little hard to believe. Oh, really? How many Amish autopsies have you had done? How many Amish do you have walking in and out of your office every day? Don't you find it strange that the rest of the world traffics through here on a daily basis, but the Amish never darken your door? I have to admit, you are the first Amish I have ever interviewed. So you must agree that the Amish are closed off from the rest of the world. Well, yes, I already knew that. I just didn't think of them as being harmful. With the interview having concluded, Misty said as she was leaving, Just remember that we are humans like everyone else. As Karen drove her car down the lane toward the house, she was surprised to see a police car following in the distance. At first, she feared that they were looking for her, though she hadn't broken any laws as of late. Karen asked Misty to approach the police cruiser to ask about the nature of their business. One of the officers in the car said, Excuse me, miss, do you know which house belongs to Bishop Peter? Ah, uh, yeah, it's right over there. Peter came to the door as the officers approached and welcomed them inside as if he had nothing to hide. After all those years of raping children and cattle, it would be best to play it cool. Peter was not arrested. Peter and the officers parted on good terms. The only person to suffer as a result of this scenario was Misty, since she involved the police in an Amish matter. It was time for the victim to be punished, because that is what Amish justice is all about. Sure enough, once the police were out of sight, Jacob, Phyllis, Lillian, and Peter rushed over to Karen's home to chastise Misty for involving the police instead of the church. Misty was so uncomfortable in Peter's presence, she sidled over to Karen and Carl. Still, she wouldn't back down. After being told to withdraw the police report, she dug in her heels and refused. Peter was as angry as a bull with his dick in his ass. She was not prepared to hold back. She told Phyllis she suspected Peter was molesting their daughter Katie and that he was giving Phyllis some kind of toxic elixir that was causing her to have seizures. It all fell on deaf ears. Even when it was only Misty who had the floor, they did not listen. The way they saw it, there was no greater sin than acting in violation of church rules. As far as they were concerned, not even rape and child molestation compared as far as transgressions go. They instructed her to drop the charges and repent, but Misty could not accept being silenced, as victims customarily were in that parallel society. She untied her head covering. To do so in the open was a significant breach of church protocol. It was shocking to the others. She wasn't about to let this go. Misty wanted them to know how serious she was about this. Peter said, Emma, don't do this. You will be excommunicated and shunned for life. Indeed, if she had just complied with the rules like he did, she, too, could fornicate with livestock for the rest of her life, with impunity. Ultimately, some things are easily sacrificed. It was time to make a life-altering decision, and considering Peter's recent sexual behavior beyond the barnyard, with a species that observes sexual decorum, she was driven to drastic measures. 
She said, You will not have the pleasure of excommunicating me, because I am excommunicating myself. For most people who live in that world, such an action was unthinkable. It was difficult to even contemplate. From their perspective, departing from those front gates would be akin to interplanetary travel. Phyllis struggled to understand. She didn't want to lose Misty. Emma, don't do this. I know you were angry and sad because of what happened, but you will go to hell for what you were doing. Misty shook her head. Her mind was made up. After all he had done to Misty, his daughters and the objects of his interspecies desires. Even Peter was baffled that she wanted to leave. He said, If you leave the church, you will go to hell, Emma. By the way, there are 49 Bible verses that condemn the practice of bestiality. For examples, Exodus 22.19 Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Leviticus 18.23 And you shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Leviticus 20.15-16 If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Deuteronomy 27.21 Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Did the Amish Bible excise those verses? Where did Peter get off thinking he is exempted from the anti-bestiality clauses? His conduct with young cows is, um, utterly disgusting. The point is, Peter is both a pervert and a hypocrite. Lillian said, You have nowhere to go, Emma. This was a legitimate point, one Misty hadn't considered. Karen interjected, She can stay out back in our trailer until she figures it out. Misty said, Yeah, I will stay in the trailer. Peter was apoplectic. He said to Karen, I want you to get off my property. Karen said, Nope, not going to happen. We have a two-year lease agreement, and if you force me off the land, I will haul your ass into court and tell the judge everything that went down here today. Do you really want that? Misty was informed that she was thereby in the Maidung, which was a form of permanent banishment. It was to remain in effect until she repented and agreed to follow the rules of the church. Nobody was to interact with her in any way for any reason. No visits with friends. Occasional visits with relatives would be permitted. Before the rest of the Amish mafia left, Peter stepped up and glared at Misty. She stood her ground, but after he left, she ran over to some tall grass and vomited. Misty contemplated her future, which was uncertain, though she did have ambitions to become a medical missionary in the third world. When she went back to Karen and Carl's quarters, Carl said, Emma, we have to figure out where you are going to live. Karen said, It is not safe for you here, Emma. Where can you go? Misty said, I don't know. Carl said, Well, there is that halfway house you stayed in for a month, Karen. I'm sure we could talk to the lady in charge. They would probably take Emma in and help her get situated. Karen wasn't sold. Look at her, Carl. She does not look a day older than 14. Those women would eat her for lunch. Well, she can't stay here. It isn't safe. Karen said, Is that what you want to do, Emma? I'll contact the youth with a mission school while I am at the halfway house and find out what I need to do to get into their missionary training school. Okay, I will take you there. But you're going to need different clothes. This was one area where old habits would die hard. I don't want to wear any pants. What would I wear? 
I will still wear dresses, just not Amish ones. Carl said, You are going to have a hard time out there like that. Karen only gets away with it because she doesn't care, but you're a young girl. It's going to be different for you. Misty was given an old dress that did not fit Karen. She was informed that she would have to learn how to use a computer. Misty called her Aunt Laura, who agreed to let her stay with her for a few months as she got her life together. Karen and Carl agreed to drive her to Seattle, where Laura lived. Misty would have to do a great deal to adapt to life in the outside world. She would have to get a GED. She would have to get a social security number. She would have to get a job that didn't involve maid service or agriculture. Misty was notified by Karen that the police had returned to Peter's house. The officer that interviewed Misty at the station decided the allegations were worth following up on, and an investigation was launched. Though the police were tight-lipped about Peter's fate, the entire family packed up and went on a trip to Canada, where they had relatives in Ontario. They did not return. Tracking their movements would be impossible, since the Amish did not have ID beyond Bibles in which they entered family-related information. The government considered them harmless, so they didn't give them the third degree when they passed the border. Misty's grandmother had spent a few days with her at her Aunt Laura's house. There was an ugly confrontation wherein Brian and Misty's mother forcefully removed his mother from the house. There was nothing the police could do since he had power of attorney over her legal affairs. Brian called Misty names, and her mother slapped her. They were able to take his mother back to their place. Some things never change. These acts did not go unavenged. Misty submitted a document to social services, wherein she reported the abuse she and her sister Samantha suffered while growing up in Bryan and her mother's house. Their application to foster children was denied, and their appeal was rejected. Misty went on a trip to Wisconsin to convince her sister to leave the Amish and join her on the outside. Samantha accepted the Amish way of life and chose to marry into it and remain there for the rest of her days. Misty Griffin has since gotten married and became a licensed vocational nurse. She still struggles with nightmares and other complications of the trauma she experienced before and during her years living with the Amish. Misty was contacted by Katie through Facebook and found out that Peter, Phyllis, and their children were deported back to the United States since they did not emigrate to Canada legally. Peter was sent to prison for molesting almost all of his 11 children. Phyllis lost her own parental rights over her children. Misty exchanged letters with Samantha. Samantha was still resolved to spend the rest of her life among the Amish. She had since had three children. Misty met an Amish woman named Sarah, who was from a more modern and liberal sect. For instance, she was permitted to own and use a cell phone. If Misty had believed that publishing her memoir and exposing Peter would put an end to that kind of sexual abuse in the Amish community, she found out that the impact was short-lived in a message from Sarah. I'm currently Amish. There's been a family of nine or so kids, and rumor had it over the years that he was molesting his kids. Of course, nothing ever came of it because he denied it and the ministers believed him. I found out from my friend, whose husband is an uncle to these kids, and they were so fed up with their father. Most of them are grown, but he does have a school-aged daughter and a 15-year-old daughter, and that these two girls sleep with their furniture in front of their bedroom doors so their father can't get in. So I tell my dad, who is a minister, that this stuff is indeed still happening. He said, well, the man denies it. I argued with him. Then that's where the ban comes in that they love to misuse. And in my opinion, the ban belongs only to unrepentant sinners. But six months later, 
and they haven't made a move yet, but instead are coming after us with things. Sadly, the abuse continues in these communities, and there is no justice for the victims. Sexual abuse in Amish communities is alarmingly common, with Misty Griffin's experiences representing only a modicum of the true size and scale of the problem. The following is an excerpt from an article published at typeinvestigations.org entitled, The Amish Keep to Themselves, and They're Hiding a Horrifying Secret. Over the past year, I've interviewed nearly three dozen Amish people, in addition to law enforcement, judges, attorneys, outreach workers, and scholars. I've learned that sexual abuse in their communities is an open secret spanning generations. Victims told me stories of inappropriate touching, groping, fondling, exposure to genitals, digital penetration, coerced oral sex, anal sex, and rape, all at the hands of their own family members, neighbors, and church leaders. And as always, the victims who report the abuse are mocked, blamed, and discouraged from reporting the offender to the police, which is considered by the Amish to be worse than child sexual abuse as far as sins go. To quote an Amish woman known as Esther, we're told that it's not Christ-like to report. It's so ingrained. There are so many people who go to church and just endure. Esther was sexually abused by her brother and a male neighbor when she was nine years old. Now that many Amish women are permitted to use the internet and cell phones, the rate of reporting sexual abuse has increased, but they are up against formidable odds. Most of the Amish have decided that abiding to tradition is more worthwhile than protecting their women and children from traumatic abuse. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.